Welcome back to Falling Walls Breakthrough Conversations. In these conversations, we are speaking with uh, outstanding scientists, emerging innovators, uh, science entrepreneurs, and uh, global leaders. Uh, we're talking to them about their research, uh, the journey which got them to their research, at, and just their life experiences. I am science journalist and communicator, Adam Levy, and I'll be conducting this interview as well as the next one. Um, now, firstly, a little bit of admin. Uh, what makes these conversations special is that I'm not the only one conducting the interview. You can take part as well. If you have a question of your own, you just need to raise your hand using the, the Zoom feature. Then a member of our team will spotlight you, uh, and then when we have a gap, um, we'll unmute you and you can ask your question. Um, you'll then be muted again, so if you have a follow-up question, uh, you know, just go through the whole process again, raising your hand and we'll spotlight you. Uh, if you have any technical questions, just drop them in the chat. And just so you know, uh, the conversation today will be recorded and will be shared on the Falling Walls website after the summit. So let's turn to the conversation we have at hand, and I'm joined by uh, Metin City. Um, who is at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems and is looking at the possibility of wirelessly controlling robots inside the body. Um, now let's start with a pretty fundamental question. Why do we want to do this? Um, great question. Uh, as you say, there are already existing uh, tethered or wired uh, m medical devices like catheters and endoscopes, which can get inside our body too. The problem is these devices can only access limited areas in our body. And when we get much smaller blood vessels and also pancreas, uh, let's say bile ducts, uh, those are areas which are very tight and very hard to reach or very risky to reach, let's say in your brain also. So in that sense, any uh, place in our body which is very, very small and deep and very dangerous to access, we need to develop wireless tiny devices like what we are working on. And what kinds of medical applications could, could these devices be useful for? There are many different regions in our body we are looking at. Uh, one of them is in our brain. Uh, we are looking at, for example, brain vasculature, where we have stroke like blood clots uh, plus aneurysmas, where uh, patients can die in hours if no one goes and uh, opens the blood clot or uh, basically closes the aneurysma area where there's a balloon that can bleed and then you will have a brain uh, hemorrhage and then die. So these kind of very extreme diseases, we are looking at how to make wireless devices to save patients which they cannot have catheters that can reach those areas without any risk, uh, as one example. And then we are looking at uh, cancer research. We are trying to target drugs and many other treatment, uh, uh, basically um, mRNA and other genes even uh, to the target area locally and efficiently. So in that sense, we are basically like robots uh, that are carrying to the target and delivering therapeutics uh, to the target very effectively so that we can save the patients with minimal side effects also. So these are some examples. Now, could you paint a picture of what these robots look like? Because Mm -hmm. I think when many people hear the word robot, maybe they even think of something like the Terminator or, you know, a robotic arm in a factory. Mm -hmm. But having watched videos of the robots you're talking about, they're really nothing like that. So could you describe what, what one would see if you were looking at one of these robots at work? Um, as you say, typical medical robots are robot arms that are doing laparoscopy from outside. In our case, since we make very tiny and wireless device first, uh, first versions look like, like a capsule so that you can swallow uh, as the biggest size ones that we can get in the body. But much smaller ones are millimeter scale, uh, also still like a capsule uh, shape, uh, and but there are many diverse shapes also. And then we have even robots at the cell size, which are micron scale. And those ones look more like a particle or helical shapes, but they are all like really 3D shapes that we can these days manufacture with different morphologies for different functions of robots. But um, but the main difference is they are typically controlled remotely. That's why they are not like a typical robot where you have onboard camera, battery, electronics, communication devices. They are mostly very smart materials that we can remotely functionalize and control, but also measure things from outside so that also they are safe to use, but they are in that sense very different than typical robots we are used to at the large scale. 
one of the crucial words uh, for this kind of robotics and your kind of robotics is soft. These are soft robots. They're not kind of sharp-edged metal uh, beings. Uh, why is it so important to be soft for robots in this context? And why does that present new challenges for robotics? Um, as I mentioned, you know, let's say in the middle scale, when, uh, these wireless devices, uh, to have many different functions at the same time with almost no electronics, one of the best ways to do it is make shape programmable soft devices, which is our main breakthrough. In that sense, we are looking at smart materials that we can remotely change their shape because of the magnetic programming that we can make some complex program of the magnetic properties, and then we only change the external field that give many different shapes. That means they can swim, they can jump, they can crawl, and they can uh, carry a cargo to deliver, they can open or close on demand, they can clog a vessel on demand, that means if you, you know, wanna have a bleeding stop, you can do that with these shape change functions that is not possible with rigid. So that's one main advantage of shape programming and physical adaptation. Then the second one is uh, safety. Uh, uh, if you look at the first history of uh, tiny robots in our body, they were very rigid, uh, a little bit dangerous because they could really cut things or damage tissues and the other advantage of being soft is there is almost no way to damage any tissue so that's why it's much more comfortable for the patients and the doctors that uh, if anything goes wrong in the worst case these robots can never damage anything so these robots are by their nature more malleable more shape-shifting but does that make it harder to control them you know I know if I've got a hinge and I move it by 45 degrees well here's where the arm is going to be mm -hmm. but when you've just got this squishy thing jumping and crawling around yeah how, yeah. how do you navigate that uh, definitely it's very challenging to uh, designing them and also controlling them as you say because the shape changes are very drastic not like small changes uh, and then any small different inputs can make different drastic changes as one. And the second thing is in the body, there are a lot of moving fluids, organs. They can also influence the robot itself because of they're also soft. That's why, as you say, we need to monitor them carefully with some medical imaging modality like X-ray or ultrasound or different imaging techniques and then see the shape change in real time and then control it from outside. Because of large changes and these nonlinearities and also uncertainties because of the different environmental disturbances, uh, controlling these soft devices is much more challenging than rigid ones uh, that we have more used to in, in previous times. So that's why everything new has opportunities, but also, of course, challenges. Um, before I get to my next question, I'd like to pass over to the audience because we have an audience question. I think you're now in the spotlight and hopefully unmuted, so uh, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think it's some quite impressive technology. Um, I have a rather simple question. Are you concerned about misuse or even abuse of your technology? Thank you. Um, so any medical device inside our body uh, will be directly controlled by a doctor in our typical designs. So uh, as I mentioned, they are only controlled by external magnetic fields, so that means a user like a doctor, a knowledgeable person also needs to really control it. So in that sense, we never designed it for any other purpose than just uh, you know saving people's lives and patients. Um, can anyone use the same technology for different purposes? Of course, that's possible for any technology. And uh, of course, uh, I don't foresee any possibilities like that, but of course, we need to monitor carefully and make sure that uh, they're not used other than medical therapeutic applications, which someone can, put, of course, implant the device and might want to do other things than saving lives of patients. But that uh, needs to be regulated and controlled by authorities. And uh, yeah. I think that's a really important question. And I, I want to focus on this question of use because um, well, where are we today with this work? I think when we talk about this, we talk about these robots maybe traveling to our brain. Perhaps it gives a sense to some these are already being used in, in surgeries. Um, but where has your research taken us so far? 
So far, uh, we had uh, relatively basic research at the beginning, and in the middle scale, we are getting close to clinics. Uh, we are in the uh, stage of animal testing. Uh, and for the cell size robots, we have still more way to go uh, towards animal testing, which we are also getting close. In that sense, we need to show them first in animals that they can function in live uh, animals. And then, if the results are successful, we can take towards uh, human testing. And, and please don't forget, anything medical device, there are very high regulations, even animal experiments. We are, we are very careful and we are fully aware of all the authoritative rules about like when and how you can do those tests um, and minimizing it. Of course, we do a lot of what we call in vitro ex vivo tests where we don't use any live uh, animal. We always do other tests so that we make sure that yeah, we have the minimal animal testing and minimal danger to human. And don't forget, medical devices are regulated by uh, different agencies that there are very, very high safety regulations. That's why, honestly, to get that these devices into clinics, besides this innovation and development, there will be a lot of safety regulatory and developments we need to show to make sure that they can be used in humans safely. It's good to know <laughs> you're not just rushing into it and injecting them immediately into the human body, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but you mentioned this animal uh, testing that you, you've managed to achieve. Are, are there, is there a particular application that that's, that that's investigating first and foremost? Um, the brain applications is what we would tr try to test. One of them was for uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, we have recently collaborated with some medical uh, doctors in brain neurosurgery. So we made wireless neural um, uh, stimulation uh, particles into the brain area where there is, when you have Parkinson's disease, this, this area gets some uh, instability. So uh, we implant these uh, particles there and then remotely trigger so that when the patient shows any uh, tremors type of disease, uh, you know, signs, then we can remotely trigger the neural system so that they can recover back. So that's one uh, application. We have already shown some animal testing, but then the brain clot, uh, like stroke-related diseases and aneurysma diseases, we'd like to also start some um, experiments to show that our devices can work in uh, animals. I'd like to pass back to our audience. We've got another question coming in. Oh, um, greeting from Beijing. Hello. Yeah, you have Hello. a very nice, you have a very nice uh, presentation about uh, your mid-age uh, robot. It's very impressive. But I have a, a technical uh, question. Uh, it's, uh, it's a passive, small element getting into the body, right? But then, once it's getting into the opatic black body and how can you trace it anymore for the any further purpose right you navigate it to how, how can you further trace it without by seeing it because the body is not transparent <laughs> definitely um, as you mentioned uh, the, there are many details that of course i couldn't talk about because of time limits but first how do you how do you deploy the robot or given device to the body is a very interesting thing and in some capsule cases, we swallow them, uh, but then typically we try to inject them. And then when they get into the body, as you say, of course, we cannot see them by any camera. That's why always when we uh, put these devices in the body, we need to use a medical imaging modality uh, to see. For example, for cardiovascular applications or endovascular applications, we have X-ray imaging feedback. And we can also use ultrasound uh, feedback because they are real time and fast and also can be 3D. And plus, um, you know, photoacoustic imaging in the not high deep areas uh, is possible. So I can say in our lab, we have all different medical imaging equipment, including MRI and CT. So what happens typically is use MRI and CT to get an offline 3D high resolution image of the body where you want to operate so that you know exactly the anatomy and where the problem is. Then go to these fast imaging modalities like X-ray or ultrasound during the real operation. Because without feedback, uh, as you say, there is no way to precisely control them uh, and also achieve the function. So definitely, um, we use all the time uh, X-ray or ultrasound type of imaging feedback to control the device. 
Earlier today, we had another conversation about robotics and wireless robotics as well, but in a very different context, in the context of exploring our solar system in the search for life. How connected up are the different fields of robotics? Are, are there things to learn from, uh, from how we design robots for space that can be uh, transferred to our exploration of the human body and vice versa? Or are, are these fields somewhat disconnected these days? The basics are the same in the sense of how to miniaturize robots. Uh, the major difference uh, of the application inside the body versus in open space like space or even environmental monitoring, by the way, is a very important application for miniature robots because exploring any dangerous toxic elements in the environment and cleaning them or what they call environmental remediation is a very important application. The difference there is since they need to operate in large space where you cannot put magnetic fields or acoustic fields from outside, um, we need to put everything on board in those cases. That means you need to have have onboard electronics, cameras, sensors, actuators, batteries. Uh, in the medical case, we can do them remotely because patients' uh, body is well-known volume and they can stay still for some operation. So in that sense, we have much more freedom of not worrying about the operation space changing uh, to a large area. That's why we can remotely actuate power and sense these uh, tiny robots in the body while in um, outdoors in the field or in space you need to have everything on the device. But then the advantage of space and environment is you don't need to be that small because in our body, to access the very tiny areas, you need to be very, very small down to cell size. But in, in space, you can be a portable, just a miniature device, which we also build, by the way, in my lab. Then you can put everything on board. I mean, anything cube size of a sugar cube, you can put every, every electronic device these days with the current technology. Anything goes to a millimeter size, then we have problem. So yeah, I mean, the, the, you, we have more freedom in putting electronics on board in these other ones. Um, uh, but then everything needs to be on board. In the other one, we can be much smaller, but we need to do things from external outside. And how do you actually design these robots? Do you just think as a roboticist, OK, I'm going to make something a millimeter big. Here is what the technology allows us to do. And then maybe speak to a doctor and say, well, what could you do, what could you do with this robot? Or does that conversation with the doctor happen first? And you say, OK, let's design something which could fill mm -hmm. this need that the doctor has. Uh, indeed, uh, in very innovative, disruptive technologies, it happens in both ways. Because we need to first develop concepts, and these are very new concepts. And the concept development doesn't typically start with the application. It starts with most create the crazy ideas. So you first start to make these shape-changing robots and see what they can do, how much we can achieve functions and control and other behavior. Uh, and then in the meantime, also you need to talk with doctors, which take a long time because, you know, getting them into new technologies is very big challenge uh, because there is typical resistance against changes because in the clinics they are used to specific treatments and methods. So you need to really show them new techniques and opportunities and they also should come with their own problems, what they cannot do. So in that sense we talk with the doctors and they tell us like where they have big problems where we can bring wireless new devices and in the meantime we develop our concepts. But now the field or my group's research has uh, converged to a point where we can just now talk with the doctors to really identify where are the most important healthcare problems that we need new medical devices like wireless medical devices? How does it feel to be getting to that point where this isn't just uh, a purely robotics exercise? It really is getting closer to the to the operating table and closer to that that dream of helping and saving patients' lives. Yeah, for that, really, you need to work too clo very closely with medical doctors. And, and the best way I found to figure out, finally, is hire medical doctors to my team. So I have two medical doctors in the team, directly consults and even works in the projects to really find out the most interesting clinical problems where there are pro uh, current technologies don't work. So in that sense, really having that direct uh, close communication all the time and understanding the, all the physiological and other aspects of the diseases is so essential because if you have wrong information or wrong assumptions from the beginning, what you will build will not never work. So that's why we look at it as a system problem, system design problem, not only building a robot, 
you need to build everything like the great question of like from the imaging, how to image this robot, where it will go in the body, what function it needs to have, how it will deploy, how it will take it back, uh, what kind of barriers the robot needs to work, how the immune cells will attack it, will it be toxic, will it have any side effects. So we look at all the puzzle pieces at the same time and then build the whole system, not only the robot, but the whole uh, around everything, so that make sure that for that given application, it, it can work. So otherwise, we only do pieces, and most of the time, it doesn't work in the whole way. And just what would it mean to you, purely on a personal level, to see, to see this goal arrive, and to see uh, these robots fulfilling, fulfilling this dream of uh, helping patients? It's a great satisfaction and also dream, let's say. Um, really, um, it would be amazing to see a patient using our wireless device to save the life of the person as the top priority, but also make the lives of the patients uh, better for, in the sense of less side effects, much faster recovery, much less invasion to their body. These are our real dreams to show that hopefully human patients can really take advantage of, and also doctors, of course, uh, so that they can really go to the next level of treatment. And also early detection of diseases is a dream for us. If you can put these robots in the body to monitor and also find out things much earlier, and if they repeat, we can also retreat, retreat again rather than doing the operations all the time. So these are kind of things might change will change the healthcare system and medical treatment uh, when we get really to the level of clinical uh, use. And when we talk about improving uh, these outcomes for patients, are we talking about uh, purely Im improving procedures that we already have, or are, are we potentially unlocking entirely new procedures and helping patients in situations where previously we've just been uh, unable to help? We will look at both ways. Uh, we are looking, as you say, the first goal is really to solve uh, problems that are not able to solve with the current and existing medical device. So that hopefully will save more patients because they are not operable or not treatable, uh, at least with uh, minimal invasive te techniques. So that's definitely the first priority. But then second is also to improve all these conditions of disease in the sense of side effects and the comfort on the patient, pain, all these things I think will also improve the uh, patient's quality of life. Um, and that, that I think is also a very big healthcare cost and also issue that we typically underestimate, but I believe more and more patients and doctors would also like to see that the treatments are much faster in the sense of you know uh, recovery and many other things, which already is happening with laparoscopy as a major step in medical device. And hopefully this kind of technology will take it to another level of much you know uh, fast treatment with minimal side effects in the near future. We are almost out of time, but I've just been told we have another question, and I'd love to squeeze it in if we have time for it. So I'm in. My name is Ibn van Arnim, um, Berlin, Germany. Thank you for those interesting outlooks. My question is, as you just said, solving problems. If I can solve a problem, I can also create a problem if I want to. Um, this technology can open a window for misuse. Have you that on the screen that people are implanted a robot against their will in order to cause problems? Um, how, how have you ever dealt uh, with this question? Thank you. Um, I think the first question is also a little bit relevant to what you ask. Um, uh, as I tried to mention, I think in all of these things, first of all, in Europe at least, and there is no way that any doctor or anyone can put inside your body without your permission any medical device. So in that sense, uh, the regulations of how medical devices, this is for any medical device, by the way, um, is all, again, regulated by authorities to make sure that for safety of the patient is the first thing, because also you can damage people if you don't really design the robot in the correct way. Uh, and then second, again, any misuse needs to be prevented. And these are all things which can be easily uh, arranged by the authorities when these devices become available as technologies. By the way, this is true for any technologies, all right? So we are talking about AI, artificial intelligence, and many other things. And always the rule is, when they become mature enough to be implemented in daily life, then authorities and governments need to look how they will affect everyone's privacy, safety, 
and, and rights and everything, and then they need to be regulated. And this is really something we all need to do with governments and everybody. Uh, and in that sense, this is the same problem also for these devices when they become real in the clinic. Yeah, we need to do the same regulations and rules. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for, but thank you so much for explaining the uses and uh, the safeguards as well uh, involved in, in this breakthrough new technology. Um, don't go anywhere just yet, because in just five minutes, we have our, our next and final conversation of the day, which will be with physicist and Nobel Prize winner Donna Strickland. So stay tuned for that. <laughs>